Imagine building a more successful hypnosis business just in the next 10 days. To learn how, please visit WorkSmartHypnosis.com and take the 10-Day Hypnosis Business Challenge. Yours free today. Welcome to the Work Smart Hypnosis Podcast with Jason Lynette, your professional resource for hypnosis training and outstanding business success. Here's your host, Jason Lynette. So I really want to start the program today with some sort of funny joke or pun involving golf, but I am so not a golfing person, I'm really ashamed of the fact I can't even come up with one. It's Jason Lynette here, Work Smart Hypnosis, session number 17 with John Ware. Quick bit of business. Again, I want to thank everyone who's visited the Work Smart Hypnosis podcast page over on Facebook. I'll make it really easy for you to find it. Go to worksmarthypnosis.com forward slash Facebook. That'll take you right there. Page has only been up for about a week or so and gaining a couple of dozen likes a day. In addition to the updates that I'll be sharing in terms of the programs that I'm releasing here on the podcast, I'll be putting some other resources up there as well. Specifically, what I'd love to show you on that page are the ways that I'm taking articles that are popping up in my Google News Alerts and how I'm then putting that into a broadcast for my clients to look at. So not just the story of, here's something that's going on. Look at the text. Look at the way that I'm going to frame the story. And many times, I'm just going to copy and paste it the way that I'm putting that information out to my list, my potential clients, my potential students, in that format as well. So look more for the context of what I'm doing there. More so than the specific content. Of course, you know, respond to the content. That's why I'm putting it up there. But look at how I'm taking that information and making it meaningful to those different groups as well. So this is session number 17 with John Ware. I've known John for several years now, about as long as I've been going to the National Guild of Hypnotists Convention, about four or five years now. I have occasionally been known to crack the joke that I want to be John when I grow up. Um, Not for the fact that he's only a few months older than I am, but specifically the fact that he's about a foot taller than I am. And that's got to be a lot more convenient than being five foot four. Uh, John began hypnosis at a very young age, and there's many major awards he's won at the NGH convention um, that he is officially the youngest person to have ever achieved these things, whether it's Order of Braid, whether it's the Ormond McGill chair that he received back in 2011 that I won this year, whether it's these different awards. Uh, achieving so much at such a young age. I can say this as he's a few months older than I am. (laughs) Uh, From a private practice and then refocusing directly on a specific niche. That's the story I want you to hear. Now, I'll give you this advice. Listen to this interview a couple of times. There's so much information packed into the 20 or 25 minutes or so that we talk. So many seeds that are planted that I'm going to do do my best job to go back through again and pull the resources out and put them over on worksmarthypnosis.com forward slash 17. That's going to be the easiest way to go to the page all about this session today. A lot of the information is going to be about golf, yet as you listen to it, you're going to hear the approach that he's done and a new piece of information that I didn't know he was doing. You know, we can work with our clients in terms of what they do to, quote, get into the zone whether it's for the athlete, whether it's for testing, whether it's for public speaking. Yet what really struck me and something that I'm going to begin to work on and hopefully learn from John soon as well, myself, is the way that he does a post-ritual, a post-routine as well. What are those things that the client can do after the experience to solidify the learning, to solidify the changes that they've now created. I I just think that's fascinating. Uh, I'll point to a couple of quick resources. I'll rattle through them here, but again, they'll all be over on worksmarthypnosis.com forward slash 17. Um, The program that he's putting out there nowadays, mentalgolfacademy.com. You can find that there. Uh, I'm not a Twitter person. I would like to be, but his Twitter page is extremely active at mentalcaddy. That's the easiest way to find him there. I'll put a direct link on the site as well as his new book that he just recently published, Golfer's Guide to Mental Fitness, which I'm looking through it here actually at the office right now. It's got some fabulous information in it. Again, I really, really recommend. This is just really packed with information, stuff that you can pull out and put into use with your sessions immediately. 
when you get a chance to work with John, do it. Um, the information he's researched, the information he's pulling into it, there's so much thinking behind all the details of this work. I think it's fabulous. So here we go. Session number 17, John Ware. Kind of the book is a stepping stone right now. We have, um, it's just basically an introduction. Uh, it's, the book isn't an introduction, but into me. Um, and then we have this new program coming out. It's a freaking game changer, man. I mean, nice. it's unbelievable. We got kids. It's working even with disabled kids. We have a 14-year-old kid from Wales. He has autism, Tourette's, and six other disabilities. And he's getting hypnotized, falling in the system. He's now competing on Wales' national team against the regular kids against England uh, coming up here. And here's a kid with severe autism, and he's out there competing with the best. And I figured, you know, with, with that, if he's understanding hypnosis through the new model and he's benefiting from this, everybody can. And it's a unique model for each golfer, which is really cool, but it's repeatable. Uh, so when we get that done, we'll have to do another one of these talks because um, we've tested it now in 16 countries with the golfers, and all of them have cracked into professional wins. Wow. So, nice. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty phenomenal. It's It's really cool. Yeah, so, I, I love to ask this question, though, um, and I was trying to nudge some people towards your class at the NGH convention a couple of weeks back. How much of these strategies, how much of these principles would you say would kind of be more of the, you know, we say the, the context of the issue? How much of it would you say could also then be pulled out by the hypnotist and applied to perhaps the athlete in any other profession, any other sport, or even applied to public speaking as well? How much of this would you say is could be could, could become rather general in its approach. Well, you know, the stuff that I'm teaching at MGH would be pretty general, um, and it, it's really applicable to all athletes. Uh, the new phase that we're doing, it's completely golf-centric, but it can be adapted right. into other sports. Uh, basically, we're providing carbon copies of the way people are using their brain, and it could be easily adaptable, but we've taken that next phase into golf-specific just because it's my market. But the stuff that we can talk about and the things that I teach at NGH are really universal performance concepts. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it really could be applicable. A lot, not necessarily with a lot of team sports. Some of the team sports it may be a little bit different, but then like in baseball and things, you have individual components with batting, uh, tennis, you know, public speaking, of course. So um, a lot of it can stretch across the board. At NGH, I try to keep it as universal as I can. You know, so everybody can kind of grasp it. I don't know how many will go out and work with golfers right away, um, but I want to give them tools that they can use for just about anybody. Well, I'd reference, and I think it was even just from one of the um, one of the teleseminars that you were on before. I, I think I recall you talking about working with golfers and specifically targeting that pre-shot routine. Mm -hmm. And I'd share with you a bit of an update or at least some discoveries that I've made that perhaps is something that you already are teaching, um, that if you're working with the professional, if you're working with that person who's competing, that pre-shot routine is already going to be there, and perhaps it's the task of applying hypnotic elements on top of it. If you're working with the complete amateur who's just kind of getting started, you kind of have to work with them to help them create that because chances are they don't have that. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Uh, and, and some of the pros, believe it or not, don't have a consistency in their routine either, mm -hmm. um, as, as wild as that can seem. So, yes, a lot of it, too, would be incorporating a lot of natural triggers in there. So the way we've always approached it is we want to create um, what is going to naturally be occurring for each one of those golfers and right. what is the process that they're going through so that we can – create triggers and anchors that are going to be naturally elicited. So it's almost begun creating a domino effect that one starts the process and then you have all these other naturally occurring triggers going on that are continuing to elicit those peak performance states. And uh, so that we don't have to worry about them being extinguished. Uh, but we do tend to give them a pre-shot routine initiator uh, with all their golfers, regardless whether they're um, – you know, an average golfer, you know, the weekend warrior, or whether they're competitive at the highest level, uh, we usually give a, an initiator to start the process for sure. And then we also have what's often most neglected is the post-shot routine. So we're also hmm. giving them triggers for acceptance of shots. And 
shutting down the focus, relaxing the brain so that we can create like a four to six minute meditation in between shots where we're not stewing over past mistakes or we're worrying about the future, but we're simply waiting for our next assignment, if you will. So nice, oftentimes nice. that, that post-shot routine is what's most overlooked. And for the average golfer, if you can go and teach them how to accept shots and give them tools and strategies to accept both good and bad, um, that's very empowering because golf's all about being in the present moment. And good shots have just as much of a power to take you out of the present. Even though it seems positive, it can still take you out in the future-oriented thinking which, again, is taking away from the task in the here and now. And so you find a lot of people getting ahead of themselves, and that also then creates negative performance on that next shot. So we tend to treat good and bad shots the same, and we accept it and we want to install strategies so that's actually being done consistently after every shot. Um, so that's something I think is a, is a key thing. And it's easy to install, especially with, with uh, post-hypnotic suggestions, doing what they call is MGM or um, Motivational General Mastery Imagery, which is walking them through those scenarios and then actually seeing those shifts happen. So you, you put them through some bad shots of the past and show those new responses on how we're handling it. And we're basically putting in new coping strategies uh, on how to accept and move forward. Nice, nice. Yeah, that's a great point about the post shot as well. Um, I, I was flashing back for a moment. I worked with a concert violinist that just in kind of a conversation about anchoring and what's possible within the mind, he suddenly the eyes flash wide and he's realizing that in rehearsal, he's sitting all the way back in his chair, kind of relaxed and not really holding the instrument in the proper alignment because it's just rehearsal. But then in performance, he's then poised up, perfect posture, edge of the chair, toes in the ground, holding the instrument exactly as he should. And in his own words, he suddenly goes, oh, no wonder I don't feel as good as I'd like to feel. And on his own, as a bit of a side note to the process, he began to get into that performance mode, even for rehearsal, and mm -hmm. by doing so was finding that he was then performing so much better in a lot of the fears and apprehensions were fading away on their own. We continued work to knock out the rest of them. But it's just that specificity in terms of what they do before and after just to really align that. Yeah, absolutely. And then there's also that element of mood congruent memory. So, mm. um, you know, kids run into problems taking tests, right, or public speaking. Why? Because they're studying or rehearsing a talk or they're rehearsing their golf swing at the range in a very relaxed state. But whenever they're starting to go into performance, they're letting anxiety or other things take over. So the brain is actually shutting down. It's not, it remembers easier in the states that it's learned in or it's practiced in. So we really emphasize what you say with a lot of our golfers, that practice is important. We, in golf, we have them practice swing technique as part of it because there's obviously technical things, whether it's music, whether it's speaking, whether it's golf or any other sport. You know, you have that technical aspect that needs to be worked on, but we spend a lot of time actually practicing performance simulation, which means we practice like we're going to play. And during uh, practice rounds on the course, same thing. We're practicing as if it's a tournament so that when you get to the tournament, it feels as if it's practice. And mm -hmm. it brings forth that same mood congruent memory and it continues to create a relaxation response when you're there. You know, because it's, it's tough to turn it on, um, you know, if you're not performing or practicing in those ways. So um, that's some of the ways that we go about preparing some of the kids, you know, for their tournament play. We're going to approach this as a tournament. Full routine, uh, full post routine, same strategies in between the times so that when we get there, you know, we're comfortable. And one of the lines we always, you know, preach is uh, the situation may change, but the process always stays the same. And that includes the way, you know, the process of preparing, the process of playing, and most especially the process of their routine. Because uh, I see that a lot of people run into problems because they label competitive golf competitive. Right. So now, now it's not the same as if you're going out to just play. And the thing is, is, hey, if you shoot a 66 on a practice round, it's, you still have to make those shots. And you're still executing it. The only thing that really changes is a lot of this idea of a label called competitive golf. 
So we we really work hard on establishing a good routine or what we call a process. And we really drive in that concept. Situation may change, but the process stays the same. So if we're preparing our process properly and we're playing in our practice as if it's a tournament, when we get there, everything just kind of stays the same. There isn't that label or there isn't a change in performance, if that makes sense. Yeah, so they're in to really simplify the terms, you're anchoring them to themselves, that their skills, their strategies are going to remain constant, and it's just how then they're going to fit that into that scenario at that moment. Yeah, correct. It's going to stay consistent. And then what we do is we're using, you know, post-hypnotic suggestions so that they're eliciting that same process. So even though there could be a lot of things going on around them, that once they get into that routine, everything's the same. Uh, it's still the same shots. You still hit that same shot in your practice round, and you feel that same comfort in executing in the here and now. Situation changes, process is always the same. And, nice, uh, nice. That, that brings a lot of comfort and confidence to people. And Annika Sormsten, she was competing a number of years ago, I believe it was in the Colonial, um, with the men. And she said, man, on that first tee before I got there, I had all my pre-anxiety jitters, I was nervous, you know, I was got all this anxiety, but she said the moment I started my pre-shot routine, I instantly relaxed. I went right into what I normally do. My comfort level was there, and I executed a beautiful tee shot and got off on a good track. So similar type of concept. And the more we can establish performance routines, uh, the easier it is that we're able to go and, and continuously and consistently bring forth peak performance. Perfect. Now, the new book that you just released, Golfer's Guide to Mental Fitness, How to Train Your Mind and Achieve Your Goals Using Self-Hypnosis and Visualization. Um, I've actually got it here in front of me as well. And the experience of – what I'd love to spend some time talking with you here too is in the last year, this has already been something that you've been doing and training and teaching and become quite well known for. But in the last year, from my perception – it's really taken off exponentially more than it ever was before in terms of a whole bunch of media, a whole bunch of uh, work, and even recently visiting your site, your website again, seeing that this is now you, this is now the brand, this is now that niche that you're just 100% focusing on. Yeah, this is um, 100% go with it now um, because um, as far as a hypnotist perspective, it, it's, we have in longer term clients, which is wonderful. Um, because, you know, we can never separate the mind from performance. And we come and I start attracting some really good quality people into my life uh, that equally are inspiring me, uh, which I found was a, a great client that I wanted to associate myself with. But I, I've been quite surprised, Jason, with just how much it continues to just keep exploding. Um, you know, more and more, all we're hearing on the pro channels, uh, all we're hearing from the talk of the best in the world is how important their mind is. And now that we're starting to create a lot more methodologies out there and people are getting more involved with it, uh, we're seeing a big trickle-down effect from not just the PGA Tour level, but all the way down into the Weekend Warrior level. Uh, like Rory McIlroy won the U.S. or the Open Championship out in uh, the British Open. He was in his post-conference lecture talking about having worked with his mental coach to overcome the, uh, the challenge he was having, which was he was scoring really well on Thursday, but then going into the weekend, his game kept falling apart. So he was talking about establishing mental triggers with his mental coach. And his triggers were process and spot. And as we all know, these things are implying NLP and a lot of hypnosis. And each week he kept winning. He won three tournaments in a row. And each week he keeps saying, most proud thing I am about my game right now is my mental game. And people now are starting to see that talent catches up. Then you get to that next level and you have everybody's talented and everybody's working hard. And then you bridge out of college and you're saying everybody's working really hard and everybody's really talented. What's separating these guys from me? And it goes back then to the mental training. And so what we're teaching people is how to actually develop mental fitness to improve their game. So you have physical fitness, obviously, but the key thing is, is you can't go to the gym one time or one month or a few weeks and expect to be in great physical shape. Same thing with our mind. And so we're teaching people how to actively take control and get really good mental fitness or getting their mind in shape to be able to handle the pressures 
to be able to handle what's going on on the course and the tremendous workloads uh, that some of these guys go through. And uh, it does, I mean, it just continues to surprise me on how much this has really taken off. But it was only a matter of time, just like with hypnosis, where this wave turns over and people really start putting the emphasis on the mind and the importance of it in, in the process. So uh, it's pretty exciting times right now. Yeah, yeah. I've been seeing a lot of the news stuff that you've been putting up online, a lot of the appearances. Uh, let me ask you this, though, from the business perspective, from that specific niche, how much easier has it been to let the promotion take off than perhaps – when you began, because I know originally uh, Pittsburgh area, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah so, so uh, I had a clinical practice in Pittsburgh for about eight years, um, and uh, we we ended up selling the business locally and moved down to Myrtle Beach, and that's when the golf world started really picking up for me. And so it's been about seven years now, six seven years full time and full force really in the golf world. Fantastic, fantastic. I'd love to ask you this question. How much knowledge does the practitioner need to really have of a sport to help the client with that sport? You know, it's a great question. Um, and as far as the golf world, everybody can immediately go out and, and begin helping golfers or other athletes. The number one prerequisite that you have to have is understanding the vocabulary. Because if you can't understand what they're trying to communicate to you, you're going to have a difficult time in working. But, I mean, I go back to my hypnosis practice in Pittsburgh. People were coming in, and I didn't have a lot of direct experience with some of the challenges that they were going through, but I understood where they were coming from, and I could understand their language. So if you can understand a lot about what they're trying to communicate, you can dive right in. Um, but if you're going to want to work at a higher level, uh, you know, mini tour, pro level, web.com, PGA type of thing, uh, you're going to have to have a really good understanding of the game because they're expecting to have someone – that's pretty competent in, in the area that they're working in. But as far as going to work with maybe a club pro, going doing presentations at your local golf clubs, uh, working with the weekend warriors, um, you don't have to have too much info because they know exactly what they want to do. You just have to be able to listen and ask the right questions and then use it as a feedback mechanism while they're in hypnosis or through your coaching sessions to help guide them along the way to success. So that's pretty much the prerequisite. Uh, the other thing is, is this, um, you know, I, I have a pretty decent golf game, uh, definitely not at the caliber of the guys I work with, but <laughs> I'm not there to be their swing coach, or I'm not there to teach a pitcher how to throw a ball. We've all become experts in helping in the mind, and whenever I go and approach people from, uh, you know, at different academies and things, I say, hey, you guys handle all the technique. You know, my expertise is how to get people to take the information and act on it. And just about every hypnotist knows how to do that uh, through all the tools and techniques that everybody's been taught. It's how to get the information to the right part of the brain so it's being acted on instead of just knowing. So I always find a big difference between um, information versus integration. And that's what we can really do is help integrate it. And everybody's already geared right now to be able to go out and effectively help athletes. Um, and, and going back to the question you mentioned earlier about the business model, um, it's, it's awesome working with athletes because what it's done is it's taken off the pressure of having to constantly find new people. Uh, we did really good work here, and we were, you know, turning people over pretty quick. And the more we come in, and it was like this constant marketing and constant turnover of clients, where now I have clients that some of them have stayed with me now for two years, and they pay on a monthly retainer. Some pay a retainer plus percentages of earnings, and they want to continue to work. They just they don't want to stop. They say, this is working so well, I just want to keep on rolling. So as far as diving into the business of working with athletes, it can become a lot easier whenever you're fixed with the right people. Uh, they tend to stay with you a lot longer. That's been the experience I've had, too. And I, I share the story of one year that I did the press release for World Hypnotism Day. And it's this local paper that prints different editions for all the individual cities. So in Northern Virginia, you'll have maybe a dozen or so different cities. And they pulled the game of, we're not going to print this in Alexandria. Otherwise, it'll look like advertising. So they printed it in another city. Well, in that city, this gymnastics coach read the article and went, oh, this is what we need. And since then, I've worked with at least 30 different uh, teenage and adult gymnasts from that place, which mm -hmm. I, I'd agree with exactly what you said, that 
to, to get started, we all have those skills to jump in right way. It's all about the context. How do you feel now? How would you rather feel? What are those things you're doing now? What are those things you'd rather be doing? Mm -hmm. And I'd admit the, the early sessions with those people, I, I kind of started with a bit of a joke of when I call stuff by the wrong name, just laugh at me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're here yeah. to work on that. We're here to work on that feeling. If I'm giving you advice on how to flip, actually, that's a fun category because you have to look at them and say, so you're afraid of jumping backwards off of a high beam, flipping and landing on your feet. You know, on some level, you're supposed to be afraid of that, but you've been trained how to do this effectively. And if I'm the one giving you advice on how to do it, we're not doing the work properly here. Um, the dream was suddenly I got the acrobat because that's just a mat. There's no apparatus. Um, but then again, over time learning from the clients. I'm then familiar now with the language enough, even though I'm someone who's never done that myself, mm -hmm. at least the language is now in place. And I can notice a much higher level of success with those people as well. Same with golf. The the dad who called for his son and said, how often do you play? And I get to proudly tell him, I've actually never done anything more than putt-putt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but right. it's that process of, you know, what's happening? He's carrying all the frustration from a bad swing into the next one. Recenter mindful moments, bringing back into that. Uh, I'd love to talk with you too about uh, the, these aspects of mental rehearsal visualization. Um, but specifically, what I'd love to chat about is where is it that you're connecting them to in that process? Is it the entire experience? Is it the successful conclusion? What are your feelings about mentally future pacing someone to their result? Well, mentally future pacing people to result is going to be more of a visualization strategy. So before diving into that, I'll just give the distinction for everybody listening. Mental rehearsal is actually rehearsing the sequential movements and the how that mm -hmm. a successful golf swing will be done or with the gymnast, you know, a successful dismount. But it's actually going through the sequence. So with our golfers, uh, we, we have them, you know, they're, they're focusing on all their things, alignment, setup, grip, posture, then their takeaway and all those things. So you see, uh, like in golf magazines or other things, you'll see all those, those sequences of photos. That's more of a mental rehearsal drill where visualization is a little bit more all encompassing. And some of the things that we tend to do as far as visualizations of goals or future pacing is we have them, let's say with the round of golf, let's say we have the final day. One of our guys is in contention. We'll future pace them at the end and say, you know, see that guy standing there with that big smile on his face holding the trophy or, you know, representing exactly what you wanted to achieve. And we'll make a very visual image of that in the mind, but then we dive through that image and start seeing the process on how it got to that point. So, you know, they're holding the trophy now, imagine diving through that, and there you see yourself on the tee executing your process and doing what you've been trained to do. There you are out on the in-between shots, staying relaxed with your caddy and entertaining, you know, whatever our strategies are in-between shots. And now look to see what that produces. There you are again, holding that trophy, feeling good. Now, again, look through that. And there you're out there executing your keys. You're maintaining your proper body language. You're accepting shots and moving forward. You're having fun on the course. Come back out and see what that produces. So, our strategy typically is, is in ends and means focus. So we show them the ends, but then we're also showing them how they get there. Uh, and we do a lot of different things like that as far as our future pacing so that it gives the brain something to fall back onto. So if I do this, then this is the likely outcome, or this is my end result, and this is how I'm going to go about doing it. And part of the reasoning behind that is, is, uh, if you look at the MBTI, we have two different types of ways we gather information and process it. We're gonna, some people are intuitive. They can see the big picture and results real well, concepts and theories, and other people need to focus on how, the senses, the details, the processes that's going to create that end result. And so without that information, sometimes we want to incorporate both so that we're making sure that we're hitting on both styles of, of processing and gathering the information. Uh, kind of like we we all want to hit on the different modalities, you know, when we're given our suggestions to ensure we're hitting that right one that's going to resonate with them. So that's really one of the processes we do with a lot of future pacing. Um, you know, with golf, it's sometimes different. We're going to have some long-term goals, and then we have a lot of short-term goals. Uh, but that's pretty much some of the ways that we do it typically, uh, ends and then means. 
and we're giving the brain the, the full experience. And what's interesting is, is we had a, a golfer, uh, she was a former LPGA player, and she was discussing going through that process. And she goes, John, is amazing. She goes, exactly what you're saying. She goes, when I was at Minnesota, she goes, I was visualizing myself very detailed about winning this golf tournament, uh, shooting three under par, and having a four-footer at the end to make this putt. And my dad was there, and I can remember making the putt, running over, and jumping into his arms. And she goes, what was wild was, it was coming down on the final day. I wasn't four feet away from the hole. I was three feet from the hole. She goes, I had a three-shot lead. I made my putt. I ran and jumped into my dad's arms. I was seven under par. And uh, she goes, then somebody was coming over to tell me that I won the tournament. And she goes, what was wild was, she goes, I didn't feel as excited as what I thought I would. Hmm. And her dad said, how many times did you visualize this scenario? She said, oh, dad, I went through <laughs> this a whole bunch. And he goes, well, makes sense because you've already been through the experience. And that's some of the amazing power. And what we're finding is uh, the Brain Imaging Center in San Antonio, Texas, says that what we visualize, whether long-term or short-term types of activities, our brains are literally creating 80% of the neural pathways needed to execute the task. So I always tell my golfers, we want to visualize perfect shots, we're 80% of the way there. You want to visualize bad shots, you're 80% of the way there. And what also is interesting is, is they're showing a lot of science there that mental rehearsal of activities or the visualization of success actually is creating and firing off the same neurons in the brain, and it's called shared neurocircuitry. So literally by wiring the brain, you're connecting that idea to your nervous system, and it creates a lot of association. So when you're in those situations, uh, the body can allow the training to take over, and there's patterns of success already established. And um, so those are some of the things that we go about with the mental rehearsal and visualization. Um, but they're so powerful. I have a quote on the Twitter page of uh, Phil Mickelson talking about mental rehearsal is just as important as physical rehearsal. And it's because it's building the brain and it's creating, like I said, shared neurocircuitry, building that neuropathway superhighway so that these correct actions are being fired off when we need them in the performance setting. Awesome. John, this has been fantastic. What's, what's the best way that people could find you? Uh, you can find me at mentalgolfacademy.com, or you could go on Twitter. We have a big follow in there at Mental Gol or Mental Caddy on Twitter. And uh, definitely please check out the book, Golfer's Guide to Mental Fitness, out on Amazon. Excellent. I'll put uh, links to these resources all on the page as well. John, thanks so much. Good talking to you. Appreciate it, Jason. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for listening to the Work Smart Hypnosis podcast at worksmarthypnosis.com. Hey, it's Jason here, and I want you to be the first to find out as we upload new content here online. So do this right now. Click subscribe right next to this video, and you will be the first to find out as I share further resources, further downloads, and other really cool things to come your way. See you soon.